All right, anyway, that's, um, that's Daniel Winkler. And he is an incredible photographer as well as all his other talents. And uh, he started this mushroom tour business uh, back in uh, 2006 and has taken people on fungal themed eco tours to Tibet, Bhutan, uh, Colombia, Suriname, uh, stuff on uh, truffle hunting and uh, maybe maybe even more than that. But his, uh, his tours are, are fantastic. Uh, they're very well organized and put together and I had a, a wonderful time. Uh, he's also uh, published a number of uh, field guides. There's an edible mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest, edible mushrooms of California. And he just recently came out with a field guide to medicinal mushrooms of North America with, um, with Robert Rogers, who is a medicinal mushroom guy. Okay, and then, so um, Daniel, was our one of our leaders and the co-leader was Dr. Tatiana San Juan. And she um, has her PhD from uh, University of Antioquia in um, neotropical cordyceps studies. So both of these people are world's experts on, on uh, the genus cordyceps and related fungi. So um, anyway, here's um, what um, we did. I'm going to start off with a map of the whole, the whole country. So we flew into Bogota. I'm going to see if I can get my laser pointer to work. Flew into Bogota and then um, we did. We took some domestic flights uh, in the country down to down in here, Pilito. Anyway, we ended up. Uh, we were uh, doing forays and doing things in this area here, and then we ended up. Uh, we left uh, back to the back to the USA from uh, Cali. So here's another. Here's a little more lar enlarged view, Bogota. So we took a domestic trip down to Pilito, and then um, we we went down here, Port Porto Assis, and there was an airport there. We flew to Cali, and another. So then this is a little more detail on. Um, so we flew into uh, Pitalito. Um, and then we took a side excursion to the San Augustin area, which is an incredible archeological site. It's, it covers an extensive area and there's just a, a, um, a great number of uh, fascinating archeological monuments and things. And we will be seeing some of those. And then so we drove, we drove down here and we went through um, Makoa. Right about in here, we went to a place called the Waterfall at the End of the World. And then we came down and we ended up in um, Orito. And this is just, just, a, just a little, little town. And we deposited most of our larger luggage there for safekeeping. And then we went on some old dirt, incredibly challenging bumpy roads to uh, the um, Isla Escondido. We'll see that coming up in a minute. And that is, uh, that's an eco lodge. Uh, we spent three days there. And let's continue. So, okay, so here is, um, wait a minute, where are we here? Okay, yeah. So this is where we were, we were looking up in here. Here's uh, Makoa and then um, come down here. So um, Arito is right about here and then we went here. So this is where uh, 
Isla Escondida. Isla Escondida is actually a big reserve, um, eco reserve, but there is uh, there's a lodge right in the middle of the jungle that you will see that we spent we spent three days in. Uh, it's like Amazonian rainforest. There, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so here's a satellite view. All right, let's see, where is it? Okay, right here, this, here's, this is actually the island because this is, a, this is actually surrounded by water. And then if you can, if you, you can maybe see a faint little patch above my pointer. That's where the, uh, that's where the lodge is. So uh, here it is here. Uh, so you can see, uh, I mean, we have Isla Escondida, but then the, the lodge is actually an island in the midst of a sea of green. So it's incredible. And to get to it, we had to, uh, um, you, you have to hike for, it's supposed to be three hours, it's longer than that. Pretty, pretty difficult, uh, pretty difficult hike. But anyway, so, so there's no roads, uh, no roads in here. Anything that gets into here has to come back either on, on somebody's back or on, on horseback. So, okay, so let's go, we'll start off and, <clears throat> In Bogota, so yeah, you can see Bogota is right in the right in the mountains. This and it's at a high elevation. It's 8,500 feet. It's an incredibly large modern city. It's like 10 million people, and just traffic like like it competes with with LA and uh, Seattle. It just I got there at rush hour. It was it was amazing. So uh, got to. Bogota, and then here's the, uh, we stayed at this hotel, um, uh, the Hill Hotel, it's up on a hill, and this is in the middle of a kind of a nice old town historic area that we, uh, you, you can walk around, there's all kinds of shops and wonderful restaurants and things around there. So, and then here is like a lot of big South American cities uh, have a big, big central square. This is El Centro. Uh, this goes back to the colonial times. So there's colonial buildings, uh, big massive government buildings. And, and then this is another, our other destination in uh, Bogota, which you, which is the uh, Museo del Oro, and that's the, the gold museum. So this museum is, is incredible. It has the largest collection of, uh, of gold artifacts in, in the world. Uh, these are artifacts that were made by indigenous peoples. And there's just incredible number of gold objects in this in this museum. We'll see a few, but uh, you have to remember that that all of all of that gold is just what's left over from when the conquistadors came and melted down all the rest. So um, so Colombia was able to uh, repatriate a lot of their gold artifacts from other other museums around the world. So anyway, here is um, some of the impressive gold objects. And these are especially because it appears that this guy's got mushrooms growing out of his head. And so it is speculation, but there's the speculation is that there may have been some shamanic use of um, psychedelic mushrooms somewhere back in um, their past history. And then this is, um, oh, something I, I didn't really say a lot, uh, some other, something I didn't say about uh, Dr. Tatiana San Juan is, she is also, she is the founder of um, the um, a Columbia Mushroom Club called Grupo de Mycologos Columbia. And 
this is this is their logo, and the logo is based on this on this gold figure here. And here's another here's a close up of that really impressive, intricately uh, goldsmith works. And just I mean hundreds and hundreds of objects like this. Here's a gold, a gold conch shell. Uh, this was one that I was really impressed with. I just, again, exquisite craftsmanship, and it's like a raft. It's got, I don't know, different kinds of chieftains and people on this raft. Uh, just very beautiful. Go to their, you can go to their website and, and see a lot of these, these artifacts. Okay, and then also while we were in Colombia, we we went to their uh, botanical garden, which is just as huge, as extensive, as beautiful, and we saw lots of uh, beautiful tropical tropical plants, of which a few I'll be showing here. And then um, some of these, when we did get out in the jungle, we did actually see these out in the in nature. So. Amazing plants, tropics have amazing plants. And here is um, the notorious Bergsmansia, called the angel trumpet, that um, if you happen to consume some of it, if you consume some angel's trumpet, you'd end up taking a trip to hell because uh, it, it, uh, it has some extremely unpleasant hallucinogen. I mean, it's not a trip that anybody would want to take unless you're a shaman or something. But um, anyway, this, it had, it's got uh, belladonna alkaloids, you know, like scopolamine and hyosamine. And um, there's reports of people using this uh, on, to drug tourists and then they rob them and then they have no memory of what, of what happened to them. So anyway, it's, it's uh, an amazing and a powerful psychoactive plant. And here's uh, Dr. Uh, San Juan found a mushroom. So we did find some mushrooms in there. So here is one called uh, chip cherry, uh, Laradiomyces cirrus. Now this, um, you might, see a little familiarity. In fact, it is related to the uh, brick cap mushroom that we're familiar with. Also grows on uh, wood chips. And only this one, this one is poisonous. The uh, ours is, is edible. But you better make sure that you got, you've identified it correctly, of course. And here's another one that I think uh, some of you may think is familiar. Um, can't say for sure, but it sure looks like um, Satharella condoliana, which we have uh, is, is common here in our in our area. Okay, and then uh, let's see. Um, then we took this side trip to the San Augustin area. Uh, the, there's a um, a number of uh, archaeological sites that um, you can go to. You can you can make a tour of driving. To, you know they're about maybe a half an hour to forty five minutes uh, distance from each other, and uh, they they all have uh, amazing amazing objects. So anyway, these uh, this area is considered the world's largest necropolis. In other words, um, a burial area. It covers a huge area. And the history of it goes back, prob there, there's uh, some dates that go back to 3000 BC, but uh, most of the carvings were done like 5 AD to 500 AD. And um, the culture that did this is, is is really mysterious. They hardly, they don't really know any, hardly anything about it. Uh, some of the uh, the early um, Spaniard travelers uh, found some of these things. Most of these, 
most of these ones that you see were buried and you'll see kind of understand how that works coming up here so i'll just go through uh, a couple of different ones this this guy is kind of cool and this one is supposedly um is is aligned with the uh, the solstices and you know so like the sun on the the summer solstice is, is in the middle here anyway um, a lot of these uh statues have these fangs <coughs> on them which is an uh, indication of uh, a jaguar cult and and which is real common among uh many of the the cultures there have a have a jaguar cult this is uh one of the the more popular ones that tourists like to photograph and it's really cool the uh eagle with a with a snake and uh you know it turns out that's the you know the the flag of mexico has an eagle with a with a snake on it too so in the background here you can see here's some more uh carvings um this area here would be a burial inside there um supported by these big rocks and here's here's another one that's uh, a lot of these again see they had to ex excavate to get this um, overlooking a, a beautiful scenic area and then <clears throat> the last site that we visited was one of the more obscure ones that is had was just recently discovered and it hasn't been um too widely visited and anyway this is what the 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 statues originally looked like that they were painted with these uh, yellow and red and blue pigments. And so this is how the, um, let's see, where is my pointer here? Okay, so uh, the burial, there would be a burial chamber behind and inside here, and then supported by these big, big rocks here. And this is, incidentally is the same kind of thing that you see in big meth, meth, um, uh, megalithic uh, sculptures in Europe called, called, they call them dolmens. And then the statue is guarding it. And then this whole thing would be buried under a mound. So again, it, these things had to be excavated. Okay, and uh, there was lots of uh, nice uh, um, paths in the in the area, the archaeology areas, and we did find some mushrooms. Now, this may look some of you may find this to look a little familiar. It looks like an ash bully, and it is in fact um, related. It's the Bola Bola uh, Bolatinus. Um, Monticola, we have, uh, what is it, uh, Olitanellus uh, Meruloides, is that right, somebody? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, and so these were some, these are some young ones, and then here's some that are a little, a little older, uh, found in the same area. And we have a neotropical purple deceiver, a lacaria which is reminiscent of our Lacaria amethystina. And these were the, the largest mushrooms that we found. They're probably hygrophorous, and they're, they're almost uh, six inches across. And then um, going down the whole middle of the country is, is, is the um, Magdalena River. It goes for hundreds, hundreds of miles, and we stopped at places along there. And this is, this is one of the places. Um, and um, this is actually the the highest waterfall in in Colombia. So this is like 400 meters. And then. Um, it continues on again for, for miles and miles. And then we went down to a, a lower portion of it where it's cutting through some, uh, some rocks. 
some uh, interesting, looks like if you're, if you've ever been up to uh, Taylor's Falls, you see those like potholes up there, looks like similar things going on here in the St. Croix River. Um, and at, we found some mushrooms there, and but we also found this guy, and I don't know if you can see it that well, but this is a scorpion, and the scorpion had, is carrying babies on its back. Okay, and then coffee. Yes, there's lots of coffee in, in Colombia. So this is uh, Pilito, which is the largest coffee producing area. And we visited a coffee plantation and this was a special plantation which was using uh, some new techniques which uh, were uh, environmentally much much better than most of the coffee processing places that the runoff from a lot of those places were polluting the streams and everything so this this place was really real ecologically minded and um, anyway they they have some different sustainable methods that they're that they're using and we each actually got to plant um, a coffee bush and if you can see over here, uh, these these things are are planted on hills that are just all. I mean, they are so steep; it's ridiculous. I mean, it is really difficult to go up and down these these hills. And yet, there's uh, people uh, going up and down those hills and harvesting the uh, the cherries and coming back with uh, hundred pound bags on their back. So. When you drink a cup of coffee, you know, uh, you don't realize uh, where it's come from and what all it's been through. So here's another, uh, another big coffee, part of the coffee plantation. This same place also grew other things like dragon fruit, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay, coffee, if you got coffee, you need sugar. So there, uh, so this is also a large uh, sugar producing area. This area, they, they, uh, they harvest the, the cane by, by hand and bring it in. And then they, they have these um, presses, motorized presses, and then they just feed the, feed the canes through there. And then the, the juice comes out here. And here's one of our, uh, one of our group uh, drinking some Sugar cane juice right out of the right out of the cane. It's real. It's refreshing. And then here's and then they they go through the whole process of then they get the the juice and they boil it down. It gets thicker and thicker, and then finally they pour it in these blocks. And then then you have these blocks of sugar which are then sold uh, locally. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we stopped at a number, or well, we stopped at a couple of different uh, forest reserve areas. And this is one, um, it's called the El Cedro Forest, Oak Forest Reserve. So this, uh, this is an oak preserve and, and um, the oak trees here, this is the, the southernmost oak forest in the, in the world, actually. And to get into it, we uh, we went in down here. And if you look here, what you're seeing here, these things are tree ferns. So we went through this area of tree tree ferns until we got up to where the the uh, oak trees and the oak trees are Quercus humboldtii, named after Alexander von Helmholt, um, who was an explorer down there. Um, okay, so heading off into that, for, into that forest, uh, we come across here some, some fern trees. I have never seen a fern tree before. So anyway, they're, they are tree-like and they're amazing, beautiful. And we have, here is a fiddlehead, tree fern fiddlehead. 
Okay, and then here's we uh, we found some mushrooms in this in this habitat. You know, this again like an oak forest habitat, and um, this is this is a beautiful. Um, I don't. Let's see. Are you seeing the names of the mushrooms on your screen? Okay. Um, anyway, uh, apricot jelly. Um, they've given this a new name. Juipinia helveloides. It used to be a uh, flogiotis. Um, I found this a couple of times, not very much. Uh, it is in it is in the U the U.S. Um, and it's it's, uh, it's beautiful. So anyway, this you know again, um, there's there's so many name changes that are going on. And and a lot of the things, some of the things that we're seeing, the names have probably already been, maybe they've already been changed. And here we have uh, puffballs and aspic, a weird, weird mushroom. It does have, it does produce spores, kind of like a puffball, and it's in this gelatinous material. And what's really weird is that, uh, this mushroom is related, is in the bolete group, was related to boletes. And here's another one. Um, okay. And here's one that some people will recognize. This, um, I don't have the, don't have the name here, I don't think. Oh, I, yeah, I do, okay. It's uh, Tremella fusiforma, so that is the same the same jelly fungus that uh, you can buy in Asian markets called Chinese white fungus. You buy it dried and it rehydrates to look like that. And we always have some of these at our mushroom shows, like at the Da Vinci Fest and kids like to, like to feel the squishy gooey things. And anyway, this is interesting because um, this mushroom, See if I can get my pointer going here again. Um, this uh, will only th will this will only fruit on uh, logs that have been previously colonized by uh, a hypoxylon species, and and if if the hypoxylon is there, it will it will in fact form a fruiting body. Otherwise, it won't it won't fruit. Um, I, f I have actually found one of these in Minnesota once in my, I don't know, 30 something years. It was in uh, Nurse, Strand, Nurse Strand State Park. And it actually had some of those, um, oh, the hypoxylons, which you don't see here, but they're little bumpy, bumpy mound like um, things. Okay, and what do we got next? Okay, well, another oriental fungus, uh, jelly fungus, wood ear. Um, this one, you know, we have, we're, we're familiar with uh, our wood ear is auricularia auricula, and which has um, the backside is smooth. These have uh, fine, fine hairs on, on the back of them. And um, is is very similar to the one to the one that you also buy in Asian markets, and that one is um, Auricularia poly polytrica. I mean poly that means lots of hairs. Okay, and I just ate some of these <laughs> yesterday because <laughs> I was running running short on mushrooms. But anyway, no, I wasn't. Uh, okay, now here's another one. So we're seeing some familiar looking things, but this looks familiar. It looks like our uh, Pycnopora cinnabarinus, although that one, ha it's got a new name. I I'm gonna stick with Pycnoporus. But this one is the uh, South American version of that. Um, again, with um, on, on pretty old, well, well dead logs with uh, uh, it's a polypore with uh, bright red pores. 
believe it or not, yes, we found chicken of the woods. It may not be our, the same species, but it sure looks pretty similar. So yeah, it's orange on the top, but it's got both yellow and uh, white uh, undersurface. Here's another one, another photo of it. Um, and we have something that some, Tim was talking about, maybe eating Amanita vaginata. So this looks really similar to Amanita vaginata. It is the Colombian, the Colombian version, um, Amanita columbiana. And um, it's a, you know, it's a ringless, ringless Amanita. Doesn't have much of a bulb on it. It's got a close fitting uh, membranous sac on it. And yes, there's, there were some russellas there in this oak habitat. And uh, it was the, this one was mild tasting. Uh, ID was, is almost impossible, of course. But anyway, it was definitely a, a russella. And here is the, um, the only bow leaf that we found. Um, and uh, I don't, I lost some of my, uh, some of my labels uh, somewhere when I was transferring some files. But anyway, this, uh, as you might guess, uh, it's got dark reticulations on it. You can kind of see a hint of of pink, a pink hint, little pink tint. So this is a Tilopolis, and Daniel uh, called it a Tilopolis uh, <clears throat> obscura. And this is this is where we found that we found that bowley. It was a nice little nice waterfall here, and then you see people looking over here at this hill. Uh, so people started exploring up that hill, and this is the site of the most, uh, the, the greatest find of the, of the tour. This was the most, the rarest and the most special. You see, so Dr. Uh, Dr. San Juan is in ecstasy as she's looking at this. And here it is, it is a cordyceps on a tarantula. And it's, uh, you know, it's pretty big. It's, you know, maybe almost four or five inches across. Um, <clears throat> and this is where it was. It was in this little cavity here. And we will be seeing lots more cordyceps coming up. Okay, so, um, Continuing on, I did mention the waterfall at the end of the world, Cascada Fun, Fin del Mundo, um, down a ways from uh, Mekoa, where we passed through. And um, so anyway, so this, this involved a hike to get to this, uh, this waterfall, and it was a challenging challenging hike uh, for me anyway. I wasn't as in good a shape as I, as I was uh, before. I went on a, a trip to Bhutan, which had some really steep inclines and um, challenging uh, hiking, but I wasn't as in good a shape. I, I wasn't prepared. Anyway, it was, it was a long, difficult hike. Uh, but there were some like really cool things on the way. So there was a series of, of waterfalls. And here was one that uh, we, we took a swim in here and very nice water temperature is just great, just wonderful. And uh, there's actually, I don't have a, I didn't put a picture in, but there's a, there's a restaurant that's actually in a, in a cave that's off off to the side here, okay. And here is the waterfall at the end of the world. Okay, so 
on the hike to the waterfall, we did encounter some really cool, interesting mushroom. Now these are really beautiful uh, blue entolomas. So of mushroom groups, entolomas are one of the few groups that has uh, blue mushrooms. Uh, so these were blue. I'm, we don't know what the species is, but it's um, entoloma, although I don't know, name changes, it may be, may be left on the, uh, but anyway, it has the characteristics of um, entoloma with, uh, you can see the, the pinkish gill, so it would have a pink, a pink spore print. Okay, this monstrous thing, um, that is a termite nest, and they, they form these nests halfway up a tree. And I saw this thing in the distance, and I went over to check it out, and I noticed, I don't know, there's some little thing, little tiny things on here. I'm gonna see if I can do a, do a blow up on here. So, so these little things here, these were, these were all little, little mushrooms. And uh, so Daniel came along with his, uh, with his really good camera and took uh, some nice shots of uh, that. And that's what they look like up close. And he came up with some sort of an idea. I had no idea what it, what it could be. Of course, you know, a lot, um, you know, there's lots of, there's some familiar mushrooms, but probably most are, most are unfamiliar. Um, okay, and here's some beautiful pink uh, mycenas. These were pretty common. We, we encountered these a, a number of times. And here's one, uh, Multiclavula mucida, and it is sometimes called a lichenized basidiomycete. So it is like it's a, you know, like uh, like Claveria, Clavula, uh, that group of of fungi. I think it's related to those. But it's growing. Uh, it, in fact, it only grows. You only find this on. Um, on wood that's covered with this, this a certain species of, of algae. So uh, it is, this is a symbiotic relationship. And in contrast to other lichens, uh, there, uh, the fungus does not, have, does not have algae growing within it, but it's got it growing around it, but they are, but it is a symbiotic relationship. And this is, uh, I have seen this before on, um, on nomophores. And so it is in, it is pretty widespread. It's in North America. Okay, here I am on horseback. So the, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell a story about why, why I ended up on a horse. Well, um, remember waterfall at the end of the world and that challenging path? Well. Coming down that path, I was, I don't know, three quarters of the way down, and it was rocky and slippery, and uh, my foot got stuck between a couple of rocks, and I fell down, and I sprang my ankle. At least I thought that's what it was, and it was, it was pretty, pretty painful. I had a, one of the guides help me down, but then, so this is like uh, you know, uh, there's five more, about five more days left uh, on the tour. So the remainder of the trip, um, I was uh, hobbling around on a, a lame, a lame foot. And I was able, we, we stopped at some little local pharmacies and uh, bought a bunch of um, ibuprofen. So I was gobbling and I made it bearable. But anyway, I, I, you know, I never let a little pain discourage me from, from looking for mushrooms, you know. So anyway, um, when uh, at the end of the trip, it was not getting any better. In fact, it was, it was getting more painful and the pain was not in my ankle anymore. It was higher up. And so when I, uh, I got back, uh, um, 
the day before everything shut down, but I did get to a orthopedic Urgicare and was met with people wearing masks and everything and my temperature taken and all that. But anyway, it turns out I had a broken, a broken fibula. So anyway, I got that treated and uh, it's healed up real well. And so now I'm back out. I did get out and look for some rails this year. I got, I looked for some uh, chanterelles on, um, on Saturday. I'm not quite totally up to speed, but it's not too bad. All right, so now, now we are headed towards the, uh, the, the Eco Lodge at uh, Isla Escondida. So let's see. Okay, so we were, we were, here we are up in here and the waterfall at the end of the world is in here. And then we came down here and then we stopped here and we, dropped off um, all our big luggage and then we we just took uh, a minimal amount of luggage because we were going to be hiking into this uh to the eco lodge which is a you know three or four hour hike oh and <laughs> uh the reason i was on a horse is because because of my uh my ankle so that was great. I had, uh, it was great to be able to ride a horse. It, it was a learning curve involved. I learned what it meant to sit loosely in the, in the saddle. I hadn't, I've maybe rid a, uh, rode on a horse about once in my life before that. But uh, it was, it, that was challenging. I learned a lot. I fell off only once and um, didn't, it was fine. But um, okay. So then uh, from here to the lodge, it was just some really, really horrible challenging roads dirt roads bumpy dirt roads that we that we rode on okay so here we are you remember from the beginning so here here's the lodge here is in in um this is the isla so it's in a sea of green and there is it's just pure jungle surrounding this whole thing so uh, we had we had to hike in from here and there is an elevation involved to get up to this point so um, this was not exactly easy hiking either although I had the advantage of a horse but the uh, the horses even balked at some of the 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 places we we were trying to get get over anyway so there it is and after going through the jungle for hours we finally arrived uh, this is um, this is the lodge. Uh, it's, uh, it's really surprisingly uh, accommodating. It's, uh, uh, you have to remember that all of, the, all of the materials, everything that comes into here had to be either brought in on, on backpack or, or horseback. And so uh, there were uh, six rooms here accommodating 12 people. Then there's, this is a dining area down here, and there's just all kinds of cool stuff in the, in the, you know, on the grounds. And then there's trails through the rainforest uh, all all around here that we we explored. And this was this was my room here, and uh, there was a hammock that I spent some time in recuperating my leg. And here's oh, here's an aerial view just to give you a better idea of what it's like. And here I am in a hammock with my foot. Okay, here's the dining area, and uh, the food was really good. Uh, you'll meet the proprietor and the creator of this place in a slide coming up. But uh, anyway, he had spent some time in Southeast Asia, so we were eating. Southeast Asian food, and uh, we ate a fish related to a piranha that was pretty good. And um, also, uh, there were a number of uh, platforms out in the in the jungle that you could climb up and uh, for bird watching. So this is 
I would say that probably most of the people that that go here, and you can you can go online and and book the place, uh, come here for bird watching, and and there's some of some of these platforms are actually even um, above the canopy level, even higher than this. And unfortunately, I couldn't make it up there because of my foot. But anyway, that's okay. Um, and here's uh, Jurgen, Jurgen Beckers. He's uh, the creator of this place, and he is a Belgian, and he's an engineer, and he's also he is a bird um, enthusiast. And there are some rare birds in this in this reserve area. He actually it was I don't know if it was threatened, but anyway he decided that he he was gonna uh, save this area to try to save these bird bird populations. And so he bought a big swath of that. I don't know how much of it he bought, but it's pretty pretty big part. And um, and built this place, and um, so he's an engineer, and he um, he spends six months here, and then he goes back to Belgium for six months and works as an as an engineer. Okay, more so then some mushrooms that we saw here, uh, very cool, and I'm not oh okay, I'm going a little slow here, but um, I'll try to speed it up. Anyway, uh, again, some of uh, these are these are Daniel's photos that he graciously gave me permission to use these. I have my photos are similar, but not nearly as good. Anyway, so these are these are Pluteus, and um, you can't see it. They did have free gills, a little hint of pink here, um, some beautiful little Mycenas with a hairy stem. This is uh, Lentinus concavus. Uh, this is a this is an edible. This is pretty good edible species. And here is a Podocypha. Cypha is cup cup on a foot. And um, this one looks like a sterium, and it it tends to it'll collect water. It's kind of cool the way it, way it does that. And uh, it looks like a sterium, and in fact, it was in the genus Sterium, but then was, I don't know how recently, but now it's in, in Podocypha, which um, is not related to Sterium, it's more in the, the Merulaceae family, which is, which is still in, a, it's in the, the polypore uh, group. And uh, this, uh, let's see, I think this was back in the oak forest, uh, Gymnopus macropus. Okay, and that's, um, we have one that looks pretty similar. Uh, we have um, Gymnopus uh, dryophila, which means, which means oak loving. And so just to, uh, you can see, see the similarity. And these beautiful, uh, Flavo, uh, uh, <laughs> wait a minute, Favolashia, Favolashia, okay. These strange looking things, and you would never believe this, but, but these, um, these mushrooms are in the Mycena family, Mycenaceae. Who would think? And here's another one, an orange one and related to Mycena. And uh, very recognizable uh, Merasmius, lots of different Merasmius, and they are delicate and beautiful. Um, here's one that was especially nice, um, uh, Berteroi and the underside. And this is a strange, a strange mushroom growing on a log, kind of a cup-shaped thing, but with teeth. And uh, Daniel identified it, and it turns out to be an uh, Auriscalpium. That may ring a bell with with some of you because uh, we do have 
an oriscalpium species uh, in our area. This is this is it here. It grow uh, oriscalpium uh, vulgare. It grows on uh, cones. Has teeth. And yeah, looks like a turkey tail. So tramites, a number of different uh, tramites species. Here's another tramites. And um, this guy is really cool. So this is another, another Antiloma with a, the intriguing name of Dragon, Dragonosporum with this nice little appendage uh, tentacle on the top. And um, some of you may uh, be reminded of something that we have in, in, um, in our area. Um, I have seen this a couple of times, another entoloma that has a little little tip at the, at the on top. And um, Oleporus or Polyporus, however you want to call it. Um, and this one has a, this is Tricholoma, which means has a lot of hair on it. And uh, let's see if I can do a blow up here. Well, maybe it ain't working. Uh, okay, yeah, so you see it's, Nice and hairy. So we have um, we have some similar polyporus in our area. We have uh, polyporus or polyporus. Um, um, what's the name of it now? Um, Arcularis. That has it has um, it's, it has these hairs like this, but it's got big big pores. Anyway, sort of familiar. Um, okay, let's see. And believe it or not, Xeromphalina tenuopes. Uh, we find these in Minnesota pretty, pretty frequently. And it's really weird to me that they're down, they're down there in Columbia. But as they do look like them. And that's what uh, Daniel says that that's what they, he thinks they are. And then this, um, this thing had me scratching my head. I could, you know, what the hell is that? Is that? Is that like some kind of a cordyceps a fruiting body or something? And it was just like weird. Um, anyway, uh, take a closer look and it has a little pedestal on it. It is in fact a slime mold, a tubifera. And uh, we have our tubifera in our area, the raspberry slime mold, tubifera ferruginosa. And it's also interesting to see that when when the raspberry dries out, it also turns this it very it looks very similar. And this is probably one of the, the most common little mushroom that we found all over different different places. Copernellus disseminatus. And um, I have found this in in uh, nurse strand before. And yes, uh, Ganoderma, Aplanatum, Artis Kong. And uh, this, you might recognize some, this, uh, this Alepiota of some sort. Anyway, this nice, beautiful Lepiota with a big fat ring on it. And this, um, it looks just like. Um, what do we call it? Uh, the platterful, the platterful mushroom. And now I think they're calling it Megacalibia rodmanii. It used to be Trichalomopsis platyphyla, and that's where the platy platter, that's where that name come, comes from. But it 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 does, it, it sure sure looked, it had everything looked really similar. So that was that was kind of surprising. Um, and this is a, here's a coltrichia with some giant millipedes. And we found there were a bunch of these in the, around the, uh, the Eco Lodge area. Bumblebee millipede. 
go on uh, eBay and put bumblebee millipede in there, you can, you can send off and, and get one for a pet. It's tempting. <laughs> I, might, I might like to do that. Anyway, yeah, so they, they're pretty big and they're pretty big and impressive things. So they're millipedes. They have two legs on each segment. And, oh, that's, that's a repeat. That's that scorpion again. Okay, uh, we're going to be getting into cordyceps pretty soon. And uh, to help make sense of cordyceps is helpful to know um, something about the life cycle of many ascomyces. Um, the sac fungi. Uh, they, many of them have two different stages, um, an anamorph and a teleomorph. And the, the anamorph is an asexual reproductive stage. And um, uh, often it, it just looks like a mold, you know, like a, something like mold on a fruit or something, or mold like mold on a, in, in dirt. Um, <clears throat> But then um, uh, at another stage of its life, life cycle, so this is producing asexual spores, and then in a, there's a sexual stage, the teleomorph, in which uh, sexual spores, and it's a sexual reproductive fruiting body is formed. And the, and the weird thing is that often the anamorph and the, and the teleomorph might not look anything alike. They would. They may look like totally different organisms. In fact, what happened is that a lot of uh, some of the the anamorph and the teleomorphs were given different different names because they thought they were different different species. But you know, now with um, especially with uh, DNA sequencing, they're you know they're finding there's a there's a lot of moles that they're finding they're finding uh, the teleomorphs um, do exist and sometimes they look really different and let's see um, okay so that's um, um, so remember um, yeah a lot of ascomycetes are in fact moles they look like moles and they act like moles, and um, so what was I getting the point I was going to make? Um, okay, we'll get to it in a minute here. Okay, I won't. So anyway, the whole mushroom is called the you know both parts together called the called the whole more. All right, so this is an ascomite ascomycete fungus. It's a xylaria. And a lot of you are pretty pretty familiar with uh, Xylaria. So uh, this is a Xylaria cubensis, formerly called a Xylocormium flabelliforme. So uh, this would uh, originally this this which started out like this, and then it turned into these things. So this is an anamorph. Uh, asexual spores being produced. We have uh, dead man's fingers, uh, and they also uh, have a have a asexual anamorphic, where they're sticking out of the ground with little look like fingertips on them. And then when they they mature, and then they turn into the sexual form, and then they look like the more familiar black dead man's fingers. But anyway, so they, this was originally thought to be a, a, a fungus that they called uh, uh, the flabelliforme. Uh, uh, it turns out that it's uh, Xylaria cubensis is um, the teleomorph. Okay, here's another, this is another example. It's the same thing that uh, flabelliforme, what it looks like. So, but then here is the teleomorph. It looks totally different. Okay, and here's some, another. Um, so lots and lots of Xylaria, um, more Xylaria. 
And then this is, I uh, hope you can see it. This is, this was really cool. This, this area on the forest floor was just these little thin um, xylaria were just sticking up all over the place. So I'm gonna see if I can get it. So you can see, I mean, they're just everywhere. And again, I don't, there's Zylaria, but I don't know what, what species, species they were, but anyway, I thought they were, they were interesting. Okay. Um, all right, finally, we get to uh, cordyceps and related species that are parasitic on mostly, mostly parasitic on on insects and spiders and and around here on uh, uh, truffles, um, Elaphomyces truffles, and they actually they actually look like these. Anyway, so there is there was at this at the Isla Reserve, Isla Escondido Reserve, we found just a great variety of uh, of cordyceps, um, and I didn't mention that um, actually. Um, Dr. Tatiana, um, she has discovered quite a few different uh, species, neotropical species of, of uh, cordyceps and has written, written papers on them and everything. So, okay, so here is one that is an anamorph. And this one is really, this is, we saw a lot of these, they're pretty common. Okay, Isaria tenua peas, okay? Well, now let's look at the teleomorph. Wow, it looks really different. And it, it turns out it's, it's kind of related to uh, the Cordyceps mil militaris that, uh, you know, some of you are familiar with. You can, you can buy that on the internet now, actually. Um, okay, and um, then I'm gonna go into the, the cyclosporin story because, this is a mold that was found in soil and it was cultured and it was found to have a substance that came to be called cyclosporin, which became uh, a essential drug for organ transplantation, it's an immunosuppressant drug. So this was it. Somebody found this in the, in the soil and they cultured it and they, and they grew it in vats and made cyclosporin and they called it uh, toly, uh, tolipocladium inflatum. Well, it turns out that that was an anamorphic form of this cordyceps-like um, fungus here. Uh, this one was was given the name Elaphocordyceps subsicillus, and um, Kathy Hodge is a mycologist in Cornell, and one of her students brought brought this in, and um, she got some spores with it and cultured it, and when the when it when it grew out, it came out looking like this, and in her experience, she recognized this as the you know the um, the cyclosporin mold. So anyway, these are the same organism. And um, there's some really complicated nomenclature stuff that, that has been going on, uh, rulings coming down from the International Botanical Conference on Naming naming organisms. But um, anyway, um, I think actually, you know, there's, now they've got a policy of, of um, one fungus, one name. So, so some of these that had two names, they, now they, they may have changed the name to, I think maybe the one that was named first gets, gets the name. So this may be, um, the, the current name here, the uh, Tolipocladium inflatum. Anyway, that's the cyclosporin story. And here's another uh, anamorph. Um, 
And this one uh, produces a, a substance that um, has been made into a, a medicine for, the, for uh, multiple sclerosis. All right, now let's look at some more uh, of these strange and wonderful cordyceps busting out of their insect hosts. So this is um, uh, a stick insect. And <clears throat> um, I should mention that most of these cordyceps are host specific. So they will only grow on, on a particular species of, of insect. Uh, here's another, another stick insect with the same, the same uh, fungus on it. Okay, and here is a cordyceps. This is one of the biggest ones that you'll ever see, maybe. Um, and this is in situ. So the host for this thing is buried. The, the fruiting body here is almost nine inches long. And um, so Daniel and Tatiana are experts at gingerly teasing these, uh, the host out from the substrate. And here's, here's what it was growing on. This is like a palm grub. And here's one, um, Cordyceps, uh, I don't know the name of this one anyway. Is, this is growing on an insect called the kissing bug, which is the one that spreads Chagas disease in the tropic. And here's a poor, unfortunate, looks like a bee of some sort with a Ophiocordyceps binata, binata. And here's another Ophiocordyceps. And I thought this was neat because if you could set the insect um, on its legs and, the, and have the, uh, the cordyceps sticking straight up. And here's another one. And this is one, um, this is on a trapdoor spider. So this is the spider's layer covered in silk. This is a silk bag. So, you know, again, and to tease this thing out. So the spider's in, in the side there with the, with the cordyceps growing out of it. And this, this is one which is another spider. This is really small. It's, you know, maybe about an inch long or something. I believe this is an anamorph and it's um, um, Gibalula, Creep, I can't read the name, the name here. Anyway, it means beautiful. And it is, it does have this sort of beauty to it, especially if you look up close here and you see the spore producing bodies on it. So that's on a spider. And um, this is uh, a common one. It's found uh, Orpheocordyceps amazonica. Um, another cordyceps here. And this is a, a moth having a very bad day. And, um, and here we are, another view of that wonderful uh, tarantula cordyceps. Okay, now let's look at, um, at ants and cordyceps. So there's a lot of cordyceps or allies that, that um, parasitize ants and they, um, they will infect the ant and they have the amazing ability to change the ant's behavior to cause it to do unnatural behavior. Um, and we'll see some of that coming up, but uh, let's see. So this is a, this is a cordyceps on, on an ant and um, the ant is not visible, but this this is often the case. You know, some, it, the the insect will be hidden, and you'll just see this little thing sticking out. So you gotta you gotta have a good eye to be familiar with where the you know where you need to look to find these things. Um, and a close up, and it's quite beautiful. 
Okay, zombie ant. So this is uh, the famous zombie ant, famous from YouTube and David Attenborough specials. Um, and you know, the um, so the zombie ant um, it gets infected, and then it it will against its usual behavior, which would be to avoid heights. It climbs up on a plant, and then. Um, and then uh, bites down in a in a death grip on a vein of a leaf. Uh, so I was just I just happened to come across an article that they've actually found uh, fossils of leaves that are like oh Cretaceous anyway forty million years old that have these characteristic bite marks on the veins of the uh, veins of the leaves. So these things have been around for, for millions of years. And here is, uh, there's a, the, the, the zombie ant in all its glory, and he is biting down firmly on that uh, leaf vein and he is done for. But before he did that, he there was a lot of activity going on. So a question came up. Um, well, you know, how does how does this cordyceps um, control the ant's behavior and make it do these amazing things? And you know, you you would expect that. Well, the fungus must somehow get uh, in, get in the brain. Well, okay. So now someone has done a extensive study on uh, this this uh, cordyceps in this particular ant, and um, what they found was um, uh, the cordyceps wasn't in the brain at all. And the other weird thing was, is that when the ant got infected, what happened was that the, uh, the cordyceps didn't form hyphae. It formed uh, yeast-like elements, like you are uh, seeing. Whoops, uh, wait a minute, I'm gonna go back. Right. Okay, um, anyway, let's see, these, um, uh, they multiply as they look like yeast. And so the hemolymph of the insect is swarming with these uh, cordyceps yeast-like bodies. And then the yeast at a certain point start putting out little, uh, little tentacles and they connect together to form uh, a network. And, and at least that is what was discovered when this person this is the main investigator. She uh, got one of these ants and encased it in plastic <clears throat> and did micro slices uh, uh, off of the plastic and then did and then did uh, photos, microscopic photos. So like thousands of slices doing the photography and then got the images, put it in a computer and used. Uh, artificial intelligence so that it could distinguish and keep track of of the ant tissue versus the uh, cordyceps so these this is muscle cells and the and the ant and so i'm okay, gonna this is a video and is uh, you'll see the moving down through all of these slices and then at the end you will see how it all how it finally um, goes together So computer generated visualization. So there, so we get a uh, we get a network, and then so again the cordyceps is not in the brain, but apparently it uh, it produces some kind of uh, neurohormones or you know like uh, neurotransmitters or something that somehow uh, cause the cause the ant to to do what the 
the cordyceps wants it to do. Another interesting thing about this is that um, the ants, of course, are a colonial ant animal. In fact, you may consider them uh, like a superorganism. They have this swarm behavior, coordinated behavior. And, and these cordyceps in the ant, they start off as a swarm also. So there's a swarm, a swarm of cordyceps and an ant that came from a swarm. And um, anyway, pretty amazing that anyone actually did this. Okay, and then Cali. Okay, so we finally, we fly into Cali. Cali is a, is a wonderful city. It's, it's about two million people and it's, um, um, it's, it's very um, friendly to, to the arts and culture. And um, anyway, it's, and it's a beautiful city. And one of their, um, one of their parks has a whole series of, of cat sculptures. And, and I'm a cat lover. My cat um, <laughs> is right there, you can see. Anyway, um, so I like cats, so I took some cat, some uh, photos of these cat sculptures. So this kind of, this reminds me of, uh, you know, like what we did with, with Charlie Brown. And there's a whole bunch of these. I just, just uh, did photos of a couple of them. Let's see, okay. And uh, yeah, here, this one is the Nine Lives cat with a cast and a band-aid and an eye patch. And um, we are about to leave Kali. And anyway, so Kali is um, the salsa capital of the world. So salsa music is, is highly honored. There's uh, salsa festivals. And then uh, I really like this is a, a big sculpture in honor of salsa. And you can stand under these, uh, these horns here and there's music, salsa music coming out. And that folks is all, that's all there is. Okay.